when he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Let's close in prayer. You're dismissed. <laughs> Go live in the goodness of the God. I mean, what a beautiful lyric. Yes? We stand faultless and blameless before the throne of God, dressed in his righteousness, his alone, not yours. The gospel isn't that you're awesome. The gospel is that he's amazing and gracious, and he's given you his righteousness, and you stand in it right now. That's good news. That's good news. You could say amen if you want. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and let's go to the word. Uh, Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for the reality that we stand in your righteousness today, right now, because of your work on Calvary's Hill, your blood that was shed, and the fact that you conquered death and walked out of the grave. Lord, help us stand well in that today. May it shape our lives. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 I had a... um, a temporary lapse in judgment that lasted about four years. Um, it's called high school, um, and I don't know anybody with me on that, but I look back on some of the things I did in high school, and I think, who, who was I? What was I thinking? What was I doing? One of those moments I look back on and, and don't think exactly fondly on was uh, a freshman year of high school. I hopped on my Huffy. I rode down the hill to Target. I walked into Target. I tried to steal nine CDs from Target. I was greeted by a nice lady who worked from Target afterwards who um, told me they had over an hour and a half of video surveillance footage of me. I shopped. I wasn't just going to be flippant about what I took. I mean, I wanted to, and so I um, was escorted back into a room, and uh, they told me that they were going to be pressing charges on me and that um, I was going to have to go to court. I went to court a few weeks later, and I stood before the judge and uh, pleaded guilty. Um, anytime they have an hour and a half surveillance footage on you, there's not a whole lot of other options, right? I mean, I'm guilty. You have the video. You saw me. I saw me. I know it. Uh, bring it on, and they did, and by God's divine sovereignty and sense of humor, it was the thing that directly led me to my first job at a church. Um, I had to be of service to my community, and so I worked for my church. They eventually hired me to be our chair stacker after the service, and God's sense of humor in my life uh, continues to this day uh, for sure. I found myself before this judge on trial, and in the book of Acts, we're going to skip a few chapters from where we've been. We left off on Acts chapter 21 last week, and we're going to jump to Acts chapter 26 this week, and in between, Paul's on trial (coughs) for what he did in walking into the temple. If you were to ask different groups of people why Paul is on trial in the passage we pick up in this morning, you would have a different answer based on each group you surveyed. If you were to ask the Jewish people, why is Paul on trial? They would have said, you're on trial. He's on trial because he's violated the Jewish law, because he's desecrated the temple. He brought a a Gentile into the temple. He's not allowed to do that. And he's steering people away from the hope that's in Moses and in the law and in the prophets and pointing them to Jesus. That would have been their reason. If you were to ask the Romans why, Paul was on trial. They, they would have said, Paul's on trial because he's, he's creating a disturbance in the city. Both Caesarea and Jerusalem, he's just creating all sorts of chaos. And if there's one thing the Romans didn't like, it was chaos. And um, if you were a person that they thought was leading people that direction, they would um, simply take you outside the city and, and kill you. Well, they were gracious to Paul. They put him in prison because he's a Roman citizen and he finds himself on trial. What's really interesting, though, is not why the Jews think he's on trial, and not why the Romans think he's on trial, but the fascinating thing is the way that Paul, with his very own words, tells us why he's on trial. And listen, listen to what he says. He's appearing before King Agrippa, who oversees a whole region for Rome, and, and he is going to have to give his defense. So he has a listening ear from the king, and Paul, in one of his longer speeches in the book of Acts that Luke records for us, is going to tell us why he's on trial. Listen to what he says, starting in verse 4 of chapter 26 of the book of Acts. 
My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. So he goes, hey, I, I, I was one consistent and two public with the way I lived out my faith in the Old Testament scriptures. Verse 5. And they have known for a long time, if they're willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. In the book of Philippians, Paul's going to say, hey, hey, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was born in the tribe of Benjamin. I was zealous for the law. So, so if you're sort of ticking boxes, Paul says, listen, I checked them all. I was accomplishing everything that a good Jewish person would set out to do. And then he tells us why he's on trial. And he says this, verse 6, And now I stand here on trial because of my, what's the word? Hope. In the promise made by God to our fathers. So, so the Jews would say, hey, you're, you're on trial because you violated um, the law and you've desecrated the temple. The Romans would say you're causing a disturbance and so we need to put you away. But Paul, if you were to ask Paul, boil it all down for us, Paul, and tell us why do you find yourself for the last two years in a jail cell? Why are you there? Why are you on trial before us today? Here's his answer. I'm on trial because of the hope that I have. I read that this week, and, and I had two thoughts. One, every single one of us will find ourselves at some point on trial for the hope that we have. Now, some of us, it may turn out to be exactly like Paul, where, where, we, where we literally are on trial. We may go that direction in this country. I don't know. But all of us will find ourselves at the point in life where, where we have to give a defense of our hope. Are we the type of people who have a hope that sustains in the dark, difficult days of life, or, or are we people that have a hope that's fleeting? You will stand trial for your hope. The question is, not will we stand trial like the Apostle Paul did, the question is, will there be enough evidence to convict us? Will there be enough evidence to convict you of being a person of hope? Hope is a difficult thing, is it? isn't it? I, I looked it up in our dictionary, just an English dictionary. We have over 10 uh, ways that we define the word hope, which means we have no idea what it means, <laughs> right? Because if there's 10 definitions, there's really none uh, that, that really encapsulate what this word carries. We use it in a ton of different ways, don't we? I hope you have a good day. I hope you get a new job. I hope the health scare turns out all right. I hope everything goes well and... You fill in the blank, right? We use it in all sorts of ways. Hope can be, if you've ever tried to have hope, especially in the difficult, dark situations of life, you know that having hope can be like trying to wrestle a wet eel. Right when you think you've got it, it slips right through your hands. Doesn't it? Anybody, any, any, any amens in the room? It's hard to hold on to, isn't it? For two reasons, for two reasons. We have a, this wrong perspective of hope. Oftentimes we think hope is um, simply a fairy tale. So we'll use it that way, won't we, the word hope? It's this idea that we have of something that may or may not happen in the future, but when it really boils down to it, we have no conviction in our heart and soul that it actually will. Let me give you an example. I hope the Rockies will win the World Series. And your response shows that you hope the same thing and that we're using hope in such a way where none of us believe that's possible. <laughs> I hope Colorado at some point gets a restaurant that carries delicious carne asada. I hope. Probably not going to happen, but I hope it does. We use it that way, don't we? I, I hope I get a new job. I hope I get a new house. I hope things work out with the spouse that do doesn't seem like it's going to. And, and really what we mean by hope is it's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale. The second thing we'll often, the way we'll often use hope is based on circumstances trending in a certain positive direction, right? The job's going well, and so I hope I'm going to get a promotion. The relationship's going well, and I hope it leads to this. I hope there's reconciliation. I hope it leads to marriage. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. And what we have is a hope that's centered on circumstances changing and trending in a good direction, 
I was trying to find out, what, what do people out in the world say about hope? If we're bordering on hopelessness, what do people suggest? In a, a psychology journal, here's what I read this week. If you're struggling with hopelessness, here's what you should do. Set some goals. Try to accomplish those goals. And when you do, you will be filled with hope. Now, anybody else want to poke some holes in that with me? One, what do we do if we don't achieve the goals? Right? We're in a worse position than we were when we started. We went from hopeless to despair. If we do accomplish the goals, our method of having hope is to continue to have goals, and now I need to set bigger goals, better goals, higher goals, and eventually I'll have to set goals that I have no way of accomplishing. I want to propose to you that that may not be the best way to go. So for followers of Jesus, if it's not hopes and wishes, fairy tales, and it's not circumstances... Where can we build our hope? What is the hope that a follower of Jesus can have that when the trial comes, they'll find us guilty of being people of hope? Here's here's what Paul says. Listen, Listen to the way he says it again. And now I stand here on trial because of the hope that I have in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship day and night. And for this hope, I'm accused by the Jews, O king. The reason I stand before you is because I am a person, a man who's built my life on and I live in hope. Specifically, listen to verse eight. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead. So here's what Paul says. He's going to describe distinctly Christian hope for us. Not fairy tales and wishes, and not circumstances trending in a great direction, because we both know that one phone call can change all that, right? So what's the hope that holds us? Here's what Paul says. He says that hope is simply and yet complexly this. It's a life-shaping Faith and practice that God is good on his promises. And listen, as a, as a body, we're sort of in a season where there's been some people that have just gotten some absolutely devastating news. A number of you, a number of you. And where do we run and where do we turn when things get difficult like that, when life gets real like that, and when hope gets slippery? Where do we turn? See, Paul would invite us, hey, hey we, don't, we don't turn to our circumstances and we don't turn to what we see just with our own eyes, but where we turn is we turn to God who is absolutely holy, 100%, every single time, good on the promises that he makes. He's good on the promises that he makes. I love the way that Dallas Willard, the pastor and author and philosopher, puts it when he says, hope is the confident anticipation of good. So let me ask you, do you you have that kind of hope? Confident anticipation of good, I would add, because of the promises of God. Now see, here's a difficult part with hope. If hope is the confident uh, assurance and faith and practice that God is good on his promises, in order to be people of hope, we have to know what God has promised, don't we? We do. I'll answer for you. Yeah, we do. You cannot be a person of hope if you don't know what God has promised. So there's a correlation, there's a tie between understanding what the scriptures say about God and you and being a person of hope. You can't be a person of ignorance and be a person of hope. You cannot be a person of biblical illiteracy and be a person of hope. You can be a person of wishes and you can be a person of circumstances But if hope is directly tied to building our life and faith and practice on the good promises of God, we have to know what he's promised, do we not? Do we not? And one of the reasons hope is so slippery for us, friends, is because we haven't really grounded our hearts and our lives in what God has promised to be true about you, about me, and about what Jesus has done on our behalf. So let me just, I'm I'm still intro, but I want to just invite you to 
soak in the promises of God for a moment. You know, let me just, let, let's just let them wash over us. That his blood is sufficient to cover our sin. That we stand before him holy, spotless, blameless. That he promises to work everything. Okay, okay, now listen to me. Eyes up at me for just a second. I know you're walking through some difficult times, but he says, I love you enough to work everything together for your good. And I know that stings. And I know that hurts some of you. But he's going, I'm, I'm, I'm working, I'm in it, I haven't left you, not height, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, or things present, or things to come, will be able to separate you from my love. You are a child of the king, redeemed by his blood. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and he is good to you. They're all promises. They're all promises. And they're promises that if we can get them in our soul and in our hearts in such a way, they will start to change our life. Paul goes, hey, I'm, I'm on trial because of the hope I have. And they're going to find him guilty. And I don't know about you, but I hope they find me guilty too. Of being a person that hope has gotten so deeply inside of that it naturally gets out of me. I love the way that he says this, verse 8, because he's going to sort of tie his hope to one distinct event. He says this, Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So here's where his hope, his hope is on the good promises of God as found in the person and work of Jesus walking out of the grave. That was the hope of the early church, friends. It wasn't the hope of Easter, it was the hope that they built their faith on, that this God speaks life into dead things, that he speaks hope into hopeless situations, that he creates out of nothing things that come into being, not just in the universe at large, but in our lives too. So he says, come to me. I'm good. I love you. I'm for you. If you're on trial for your hope, would there be enough evidence to convict? He, he goes on, Paul does in this chapter of Acts in his defense in front of King Agrippa to give us some ways that we can see the hope that's in his soul coming out in his life. These are evidences of hope. These are things that, that the jury would look at and go, yeah, he's, this guy is a hopeful person. He's guilty. He's guilty. I want to propose to you that there are things that should come out of our lives too if we are people of hope. Four things I want to give you as we look at Paul's defense in front of King Agrippa here in the book of Acts. Chapter 26, continuing in verse 9. Here's what Paul says. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And so I did in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Now, you might have a shady past. I might have a shady past. Can we all agree? It's probably not that shady. And he's going, I was putting Christians to death because of their faith in Jesus. Verse 11. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. In a raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Here's what, here's what Paul says. I was a person so committed to the law, and I was a person so committed to the Old Testament scriptures and the way that he read them. I was so committed to that, but I was not a person that was committed to love. I would put people up on trial just because of their faith in Jesus, and I would cast my vote to kill them. But then he becomes a person of hope. Then, then, he, then he gets introduced to the, the king of kings and the lord of lords, and this hope gets so deep inside his soul, he finds himself on trial for it. But, but here's what he would say. Part of the evidence that convicts him is, I'm a changed man. I'm a changed man. I used to be this blasphemer. I used to be this angry person. I used to put Christians to death, he says. But then I encountered the living Christ, and I'm changed. Man, you guys... We still believe this message of the cross and redemption, grace and mercy found in Jesus changes people. We do. We, do. we wouldn't exist as a church if we didn't believe that wholeheartedly. That when hope gets deep down inside your soul, it changes you. Not overnight, but over time. And we believe 
that your history does not determine your destiny. That Paul's history didn't determine his destiny. He was an angry blasphemer. He was a murderer by way of casting his vote for, towards innocent people. But God takes his life and God pulls it out of the pit. And he does the same thing in lives of people today too. Anyone want to just raise your hand and say, yep, that's me. That's me. I once, once was this. I, my former life, I was this. But now God has redeemed me. And the lie the enemy wants you to believe is you will always be who you are. But the power of hope says that does not have to be true. That doesn't have to be true. He's good. And when hope gets in you, it changes you. Let me, let me, I'll just, I'll just prove it to you. Have you ever met somebody, um, let's just let's say, have you ever met a young man who thought or hoped he had a chance with a beautiful woman? I mean, they change, don't they? I mean, all of a sudden, this guy's like grabbing doors. Hey, can I help you? Can I carry that for you? I mean, if they're in high school, they may start doing their homework or they start working out. They're a changed person, Right? We do the same thing um, at work. If we think uh, promotion is on the horizon, we'll work a little bit harder, won't we? We'll do a little bit better job. We'll follow through on everything we say we're going to do. Why? Because when hope gets in you, it changes you. The same thing happened to the Apostle Paul in his life and his walk with Jesus. Listen to the way that the prophet Isaiah will talk about hope. He says this, Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who say it with me, Hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll become a different type of person. They'll be able to walk through the valley of the shadow of death knowing that God is with them. They're changed. They're different. We use the terminology gospel transformation here. It simply means we, we, we're convinced that when the hope of what Jesus has done on Calvary's Hill gets into your soul, you change. You change. So we'll keep pointing you back to him. Here's the way that Paul continues, verse 12. He says, In this connection I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in, Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. It's an idiom. It's a way of him saying, um, I'm, why are you swimming against stream? Verse 15, and I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said to me, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's the third time in the book of Acts that Dr. Luke has recorded for us Paul's testimony, his story. The way that he became the person that he is. Paul loves sharing this. Whether he's on trial, whether he's just simply sharing the good news with people, he points back to this event. I was walking, I saw a light, I was knocked to the ground, and I met Jesus. And I'm different because of it. You see, people of hope, people of hope, aren't just people who are changed. They're people who have an encounter, <laughs> People of hope are people who, who meet Jesus. It's as though hope in the good promises of God and his provision in Jesus Christ is as though when we really believe that, it takes us, that hope takes us and puts our hand in Jesus's and the information we have about Jesus isn't just head knowledge, it starts to become heart knowledge. And it changes us from the very inside out. Paul goes, one of the evidences that I'm a person of hope is I have met the living Christ. I've met the living Christ. Did you know Jesus' invitation to you isn't come and find out a whole bunch of information about me? It's not. Information is important, and you can't have hope without it, but it is not the end. It is not the end. In fact, Jesus says to a bunch of Pharisees who, who love the scriptures, he says, hey, you search the scriptures and you know the scriptures, but the scriptures point to me and you refuse to come to me and have life. It's not about just knowing about Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus, walking with Jesus, being transformed by Jesus. 
allowing him to speak to you and say, listen, you're, you're, you're off base. You're walking in sin. You need to repent. You need to come home. These are all byproducts of building our lives on a hope that exhibits itself in an encounter with the living Christ. If we aren't people of hope, I would submit to you, we'll never be people of encounter, of experience, of walking with Jesus, not just talking about him. Are you, are you tired of hearing Christians just simply talk about Jesus? I am, without really knowing him. Paul goes, hey, one of the evidences to convict me is I, I, I met him. I walk with him. He lives his life through me. Galatians chapter 2 would say. And indeed, his, uh, what he says in the very beginning is God raised him from the dead. His implications here is Jesus is alive. And we're going to celebrate it in a few weeks, friends. We're going to celebrate the resurrection together. But the implications of the resurrection are absolutely huge. It means that you and I, we can have friendship with Jesus. We can know him. We can be known by him. We can walk with him. This is the hope. This is the hope that Paul grounds his life in. Christianity is always more than an experience, but it's never less. But it's never less. I think it begs us to ask the question, what's your story? What's your story? How'd you come to know this Jesus, if you have? How's he called you out of darkness into light, as Paul says? How's he spoken redemption over your life? Do you, do you love to tell your story? Paul loved to tell his. I think it not only led him to hope, but it stirred a hope that just resonated in his soul. He goes on and says, verse 16, but rise and stand on your feet. This is what Jesus has said to him. But rise and stand on your feet, for I appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. That's good news, yes? The message, turn from darkness to light. This is a message of hope. Turn from darkness to light that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So here's this third evidence. One, I'm a transformed man. I'm different. Two, I have walked hand in hand and do walk hand in hand with a good God. His name is Jesus Christ. I've met him. And finally he says, God lit up my life with purpose. God lit up my life with purpose. If you find people of hope, you will always find people of purpose. Because people of hope, they can't hold it inside. They can't hold it inside. Um, Kelly and I, we made some rookie mistakes when we were young parents. Still do. One of them was we would tell our kids really early on about something fun that was coming later on. So, like, hey, in two weeks, your grandparents are coming. Now, that's devastating to do. That's for free if you're a young, new parent. Don't ever tell your kids what you're going to do, right? I'm, so here's what happens for those next two weeks. Well, what are we going to eat while they're here? What are we going to do while they're here? Are we going to go swimming? Are we going to get to go play at the park? Are we going to? Are we going to? Are we going to? And we'd just be like, Grandma and Grandpa aren't coming anymore. <laughs> we're done. Right? We, we, we're not over making this mistake. We made it recently. Kelly and, and our oldest son, Ethan, are, are after church going to this family funplex with Ethan's school. So we tell him a few days ago, he's like, is there going to be, um, there's going to be bumper cars there, there's going to be mini golf there, there's gonna, what are we going to eat, are we going to get to go ice skating? And yesterday he goes, is there going to be fire there? <laughs> fire? <laughs> what? I'm like, I look at Kelly, I'm like, fire? And she says to me, you would have wanted fire when you were six. I'm like, and then I stop and pause. I'm like, let's be honest, I'd want fire now. It sounds awesome. But right, it's this hope that starts to get inside of you of a good future. And there's just questions and there's anticipation and there's excitement. And you want to be a part of it, don't you? This is what Paul says. Hope got inside me in such a way 
that has sent me, and the life-shaping hope built on the promises of God is always ascending hope. I love the way that Emily Dickinson put it when she writes this in one of her poems. She says, hope is the thing with feathers, as if to say it causes you to fly, that perches in the soul and sings a tune without the words and never stops at all. See, if you find lazy people, you will find hopeless people every time. Every time. But if you find people who are invested, people who are driven, people who long to see God move and work, you will always find people of deep and abiding, life-changing hope every single time. Listen to the way that some of the missionary, great missionaries of our rich history talk about this purpose, this sending. Hope gets in them in such a way that it just like a slingshot launches them into the world to walk with Jesus. Listen to what some of them said. William Carey, the father of modern missions, a missionary in China, said this, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. David Livingston, a missionary in Africa, said, if a commission by an earthly king is considered honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? He's like, I'm a hopeful person, a person of purpose and calling and mission. John Keith Falconer said, he's a missionary to Yemen, he said, I have but one candle of a life to burn, and I would rather burn it out in a land filled with darkness than in a land flooded with light. C.T. Studd, a missionary in China, and can we all agree if with that name he's going to be epic? pretty awesome. C.T. Studd says, Christ wants not nibblers of the possible, but grabbers of the impossible. What a stud. (laughs) John Piper, the great pastor, says, to belong to Jesus is to embrace the nations with him. I want to propose to you that we will never do that, we won't even think about doing that, unless we are people like Paul of deep and abiding hope, who believe that what God has promised, he will be good on, he will deliver, he will come through, and when that vision of the future gets inside your soul, it just launches you and sends you. This isn't a guilty, you need to share your faith more. This is a please invest time in knowing and abiding in the scriptures and the natural direction of your life will be, Jesus, you are great and your hope is inside of me in such a way that I can't shake it and I need to share it. Can't shake it and I need to share it. What I love about Paul is he never deviates from this calling even when he finds himself in jail. So two years he's been in jail and he gets a hearing in front of King Agrippa and he is just as fiery as the day he went in, is he not? I mean, he's like, hey, I've had some time to think about this and I still think what I thought. Jesus is amazing. He walked out of the grave. His grace is sufficient. His power is in me. And King Agrippa, he says in verse 28 and 29, you should turn and become a follower of Jesus. Why wouldn't you? I mean, he is just as fiery and I love that. I love that. I love that. So when hope gets in us, it it changes us, it it transforms us, it leads us to an experience with the the slain risen lamb, his name is Jesus, and it gives us a beautiful purpose in life. And finally, here's what Paul says, verse 22, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. Anybody need the help that comes from God? I've had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying to both small and great, saying nothing that what the prophet, but what the prophets Moses said would come to pass, that Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Two years later, his message is God has sustained me. God has walked with me. God has provided for me, and I have lacked nothing. I have a help that comes from God. And that's the fourth evidence of people who are people of hope. They're people of perseverance. A life-shaping hope is always a life-sustaining hope. 
And when life gets difficult and when life gets dark and when life gets hard and when the phone call from, comes from the doctor and things aren't going in the direction that you want it to go, the question is, will we be the type of people who are grounded enough in the promises of God to say with Paul, I have a help that comes from God. And those hard times in life are the times when it's most difficult to have hope and most necessary to keep it. Most necessary to keep it. I love the way that the author of Hebrews puts this when he writes this. We have this, and he's talking about hope, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, friends. So this is the picture is the storm comes and the boat of life is getting buffeted by the waves of disappointment, by the waves of this isn't turning out the way that I want it to, of the waves of for Paul it was jail. And when, when that comes, he says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. He goes, this is an intimate hope with Jesus where he speaks to you and says, I have not let you go. I am for you even in the midst of the storm. I love you. My love will not let go. It will not run dry. I am at work. I will be at work. I'm good and I'm for you. And will you look up at me for just a second? Some of you need to hear it today. Some of you need to hear that today. That a hope that's grounded in the promises, the good promises of God is a hope that the scriptures say in Romans chapter 5 verse 5 will not disappoint and so I just want to encourage you. There's some of you, you're going, man, God, I, I, I don't see how you're at work in this. I don't see how you're moving. I can't hear your voice. I don't feel your hand. And what I want to do is I want to push you back to the promises of God that he says I will always be good on. Always. Every single time. In the valley of the shadow of death and in the beauty of the mountaintop, I will not change. I will not change. I love the way that the pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King, says it when he says, we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. We must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. So here's the evidence stacked against Paul. He goes, I'm, I'm a changed man. I'm transformed. I've experienced, I've walked with the living Christ. He says, I'm a person of purpose and calling and mission. Hope got in me in such a way that it stirred me to get it out of me. And finally, hope's carried me. Through the years of jail, he would say, he's lacked nothing because he's had a help that comes from God. So let me ask you, friend, if you are on trial for being a person of hope, and all of us will be at some point, would there be enough evidence to convict? I mean, is hope that in you that it gets out of you? And you see, as followers of Jesus, we're invited to build our lives on the good promises of God, the future that he has already purchased by his blood on our behalf. But in closing, I just want to, I want to point out that according to this passage and others, that hope is a confidence in God's promises. We've already talked about that. One of my favorite passages, though, says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, that all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. All of the promises. So there's not one promise, which is what all means, there's not one promise that lies outside of the work, both finished and future work, of Jesus. Not one. You're never going to read one in the scriptures. So, God's promise is equal, Jesus' work and his provision. So, based on the fact that hope is a confidence in God's promises and that God's promises are Jesus, hope is not just I wish it will happen or I dream it will happen or if my circumstances go this way, I can't hold on. Hope is I'm grounded in the person and work of Jesus. He is sufficient. He is enough. He is good. He is present right now. And so, in closing, what I would like to invite you to be is not to be people who just have hope. But I want to invite you to be the type of people 
who let hope have you. The work of Christ that I want to propose to you transforms you. That I want to propose to you leads you to an experience with the living, slain lamb, Jesus Christ. That I'd like to propose to you when it gets inside of you, stirs you, messes with you, you find yourself doing things you just wouldn't naturally do. And I want to propose to you that on the darkest days of life, he is the one who will walk with you, sustain you, love you, carry you all the way into the destiny he already purchased for you. Friends, let's be a people of hope where when we're put on trial for it, there's no doubt. Guilty. Guilty. I am confident in the promises my God has made and he's kept in the work of Jesus who walked out of the grave and gave us new life. I don't know what situation you're walking through right now, but I know the God who holds that situation in your hand as you walk it. Will you hope in him? Let's pray. King of kings, Lord of lords. Seated on the throne right now, Jesus, we love you. And we long not to just people to be people who have hope, but who step fully into it. Not making provisions if you don't come through, but just giving ourselves to you because we believe that you are good and that you're good on your promises. Help us be people that know them. Help us be people who rest in them. Help us be people that are transformed by them, that experience them, that are sent by those promises of the goodness and that are sustained in the dark days of life by a deep and abiding hope in you and you alone, King Jesus. It's in your beautiful, powerful name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me?